Hey, Andy, how you doing? Hey, Jed, what's up? Not a whole lot, you know, um, uh, in my in, in my neck of the woods, but there's sure a lot going on in education policy and charter school policy. Liked your post today on uh, the, the latest piece of scores and all those things. Lots of stuff we could dive into. Um, so you're but dating us. You're dating us already for listeners. So we record. We're recording this on a Friday. It'll come out sometime next week. So who knows what'll happen between now and then. So you have to take everything with that with that uh, caveat. But you know, I thought that maybe we would dive in today, um, having a, a visitor from from Fordham, uh, who's just finished a great new piece on uh, on the effect of competition in the charter school space. Um, so, any any uh, uh, other introductory comments you want to make, Andrew? Andy, or you want to just dive into stuff? Well, if I don't think that's a good idea, it's a little late now, right? Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, no, stop me. Stop me if you got something else on your mind. Whatever, I you know. Uh, no, I think this. I think this will. Um, I think this will get. It's actually. It's a really interesting uh, study. It's good to have a guest. Although people seem to really like the last. I got a lot of feedback on the last podcast. Um, but I think it's. Yeah, I think it's great to have a guest, and I'm super glad that this particular person was able to take time out. The study just came out this week. Was able to take time out uh, of their busy week uh, to join us. Well, let's bring David in. David Griffith is uh, joining us. Uh, who has written several reports now for Fordham. David, thank you for being with us today. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And, David, that so, is a fantastic house you have. Uh, yeah. I mean, wh what is Mike paying you guys over there now? <laughs> yeah, this is, my, this is my row house in D.C. Everything that you see is 100% <laughs> Uh, well, I already asked him before we started recording whether he plays piano, and he doesn't, right? So um, that piano is, uh, looks looks like it needs to be used by somebody in the family there. That makes two of us. Do you play an instrument, Jed? I was just saying that you know my grandmother sent me her grand in the last year of her life, remembering that when I was eight years old, I played piano, and, and, and not knowing that I'd given up piano playing for like 25 years. So I got it, and I felt so shamed by it. I got some lessons, and now... I play well enough to irritate the neighbors. That's fantastic, though. Yeah, That's not my big regrets. Know. My wife's a very good musician. She's in a band and so forth. And like, but I am. Uh, she's one of these very musical people. I am not. So like, when we do like our concerts and stuff, I do the business and logistics side because I, you know, everyone say you talk to musicians. They're like, it's not true that everyone can't be a musician or has two left feet or whatever. But I actually think it is. I'm, I'm living proof. My lived experience is that that's actually true. I'm good at uh, listening to music, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Consuming it. Well, um, well, I could go on on piano playing forever, but let's let's dive into you know, David, your new report. Um, look, I've just liked how Fordham has kept the all boats rising story um, a, a central piece that you're coming back to again and again. If I recall, your all all boats rising or something titled something similar to that came out in like 2019. Uh, I think it um, was a great piece. I am constantly reminding charter folk that, you know, we need to be able to talk about how uh, all of public education is improving as we grow. It's so important that I think um, the other side knows that the counter narrative is their most valuable one. I think like in, in Massachusetts, when question two was voted down, basically the voters after the fact, you know, we did, we did an autopsy. They bought that charter schools in Massachusetts were actually doing a better job with kids, but they had been convinced that the growth of charter schools somehow makes all other schools worse. And so they voted it down. And for me, all of our advocacy has to pass the question two test. Yes, we're doing a great job with kids, but as we're growing, everything is getting better. Um, and the competition piece is one of these uh, these ideas about how things get better. And now you've come out with this new report, which really focuses on uh, focuses in on competition. Why don't you share with our listeners to begin with? You know, what's the study? What are the main findings, and what you think the significance is? Yeah, well, thanks so much um, for that uh, sort of segue and 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 laying the table like that. Um, the, the, the gist of the study is that uh, we wanted to look as comprehensively as possible at um, the level of competition that school districts around the country are facing, and in particular, the big school districts. And there's obviously a lot of overlap between competition and school choice, but we chose competition as our lens because uh, it's very, very hard to quantify school choice comprehensively, as I'm sure the two of you know. Um, there are so many different kinds. We don't have sort of universal access to, to, to student level data that allows us to, to follow kids, you know, wherever they're going. So 
basically you can't quantify school choice comprehensively. But if you limit yourself to um, places, you know, to homeschooling, to charter schools, and to private schools, which are sort of these truly independent institutions that are not creatures of the district, uh, then you can make a run at it. And so that's what we tried to do. Um, to my knowledge, nobody has really tried to do this before, um, but we tried to tell the story in the 125 biggest districts in the country of um, how many kids were not attending district schools, uh, how that number varied, uh, you know, depending on which group you belong to, and how it had changed over time. Uh, and you know, there, there are four big findings, but I think the one that I, I don't want to overlook is the first one, and that is basically um, that the death of traditional public schools has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, there is this media narrative, um, and I'm, I identify center left, but it is a media narrative, right, that uh, public schools are dying, right? And, um, you know, as, as with so many stories, there's sort of a grain of truth to that, right? Uh, but it also is exaggerated. And so when you look at the biggest school districts in the country, despite the growth of charter schools, despite the growth of voucher programs, despite the growth of homeschooling, um, you know, in your typical big district, 80% of kids are still, still, still attending traditional public schools. Um, and so all of the sort of sturm and drang that surrounds school choice is really about the move from about 15% to about 20% of kids who are not in uh, your standard issue district run school. Um, so it's just, you know, it's overblown. And if you take the view um, that competition is good, that choice is good, uh, then we still have a lot of work to do. Okay, so staying on st staying on that for a second, I do think that's really interesting. We'll get like, but let, let's just stay on that thought for a second. I think a, a parlor game you're hearing more and more with this, because you do have some places that are now saturated with with choice, and people are like, "Oh my God, this guy's gonna fall." But like among like serious analysts, the parlor game that you hear a lot is okay. Like in a really saturated environment, so with like ESAs, charters, some significant penetration of of, of private and parochial schools. Like, what number are you? Do you actually expect to see? And if you ask, sort of, you ask that question on Twitter, people are like, "Oh my God, public schools are dying. Only ten percent of the kids will be left." But like in reality. People who study this are giving really pretty high numbers, which doesn't mean that's not a problem from a school finance standpoint or won't be disruptive, but it's not the bottom falling out. So say just say a little bit more about that, because I think that's like just a super important piece of context here uh, just to start with. Yeah. So let me just say, first of all, I, I don't have the magic number. Right. I don't think we really know uh, what you know, how many parents are truly, truly dissatisfied um, with their traditional public school to the point where they would walk. And I think, I think the answer really, it depends so much on context, right? It depends on like, are the alternatives fully funded, right? Or are you going to take a hit in your, in your, your pocketbook, right? I mean, is there a, is there sort of a culture of school choice that has existed for a decade and a half, right? I mean, to some people, the idea is scary or strange, right? But it's not to people in Arizona, right? It's not to people in DC or Louisiana. So there's a sort of acculturation piece to it as well. Um, just to sort of put some context on it, though, I mean, I think folks in the field understand that at this point, New Orleans is, for all practical purposes, right, 100%, you know, school choice, whatever you want to call it. Um, after that, right, you've got uh, DC, right, which is maybe at about 50%, right? Um, Detroit, San Antonio is higher than people think. But your standard... Um, your, your standard district is still somewhere in the low twenties or the teens. Right. And I, I personally, I just find it hard to believe that if you really put all schools or all options on an equal playing field, right. That 80% of parents would pick, you know, their, their, their sort of district run school. Um, if, if charters had full access to facilities funds, right. If, if, you know, per people funding were identical. If you had um, sort of a good centralized enrollment system that was easy to use, that didn't, you know, sort of implicitly preference just doing what everybody else was doing. I just find it very hard to, to, to believe that 20% is the ceiling. So I don't know what the ceiling is, um, but I don't think it's 20%. So I think like another way to say it might be like, if you have that in, off of that environment, enrollment will be less than it is now, but it will probably not be as catastrophic as the naysayers, the naysayers claim. 
Yeah. I, so look, there are some, I think there are some hard, like, let's get, be real here, right? Tran transportation is an issue, right? When you yeah. get out of the ivory tower and you talk to like actual parents, they don't particularly want to drive an hour yeah. and a half yeah. across yeah. town just to go to a school that maybe scores at the 62nd percentile for right. uh, school growth instead of the 60, you know, instead of the 60th, right? Like nobody's going to do that. And so, I, you know, I do think that the sort of end state may have a, a, a fair number of traditional public schools in it. Um, but I don't think it's 80%. Yeah. No, okay. That's good. I don't want to, I don't want to believe it. I think it's this important context because th this debate can quickly get like, you know, unhinged or hysterical around like school choice. And I do, I don't, I don't know that we're playing between the 40 yard lines, but we're definitely not playing between the, you know, the whole field. Yeah. David, can you talk a little bit more about the effect of competition? This was a part of the, the study and you and you basically did a survey of the field and you showed that the vast majority of research seems to suggest that competition is in fact, uh, as common sense would suggest, uh, a positive force within public education. But I think it's one that we have to keep revisiting because there are some people out there that would identify competition within public education as being the big boogeyman that we want to try and keep out however we possibly can. Any, any and way you David, would summarize you for us? That, could you just quickly, I, I think that's really important. I want to talk about that, Jay. Just real, real quick for people who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Like we're talking about the top 125 and so forth. Just give us, I mean, I think people think of like a New York, LA, Chicago, but a lot of these districts are not necessarily. So just help for, especially people who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Just kind of understand what are we, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Like, uh, so Columbus and makes the cut, right? So, I, I mean, it is true, right? It, there's a very quick falling off after the top five to 10 districts. Right. And you start talking about a lot well, of after that Michigan game, that's the least we can do for them is like, <laughs> He went to Trilly, man. I, I cannot escape from football talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we're talking about a lot of, like, medium-sized districts, right? Uh, inner ring suburbs like Arlington, Fairfax, uh, you know, Wake. Um, it, it's not necessarily Chicago, right? right? Um, so, But it's not small towns either. Great. And then, obviously, to Jed, so to Jed's question, the effect of competition, you guys have a lot, the demographic breakouts, I think, are super interesting. Yeah. Well, let me just, let me speak a little bit to just the research on competition. I, like any literature, right, it is nuanced when you really start to dig into it. So I will try to summarize it without doing too much violence to that or going on for an hour, <laughs> right? Overall, the research is positive. Um Somewhat interestingly, at least to me, it's actually more positive for uh, for vouchers and for private school choice than it is for charters. Um, and I think there's a there, I think there's a reason for that, and, and or at least this is where my gut feeling is on it. Um, I think that there are probably some some transition costs associated with dropping a, an entirely new school into a community um, that hasn't had it before. Uh, and so I think you know when you're talking about like um, you know, like a sort of a smaller suburban uh, or, or rural district, th there could be some transition costs. But I think over a 10 to 15 to 20 year time period, right, um, I think, which is which is kind of the, the what many of the studies are, are looking at, um, I, I think there's just no question that competition on average is, is positive. Um, and I think it's also really important to just note, like people, you say competition and people, you know, they picture like, I don't know, some sort of cutthroat test factory, right? But there's no reason that you only have to compete over tests, right? I mean, you can compete to see how safe your school is, right? You can compete to see how nurturing it is, right? You can compete to see who has the most fun recess, right? Um, so that's kind of where I always start is like, look, when we talk about competition, right? Rationally, most parents, I mean, it, most parents do not care about test scores, right? What they care about are these other things, right? Uh, is is it the kind of place where you'd want to send your kid, right? And so, rationally, when you're when you're in competition, right, with another school, it, you should want to make your school attractive based on those metrics, right? You should want to make it um, a place that anyone would want to send their their kid, right? And so, uh, I, I think it's important to try to get past. Um, this sort of very sterile uh, view of competition as um, just kind of inherently dehumanizing. I don't think that's true at all. 
I think I bring some some advocacy lens to this that um, may not be right to spend too much time on for this conversation, but something I think is is a reality is that in some at least some places uh, where the establishment has huge huge power, they essentially believe that they don't have to compete, that they can literally just stop. So when when a UTLA strike happens in Los Angeles. Uh, there's, they, they can say, basically say, we refuse to compete. And we got the political power to make sure that, that there will be no further competition here. And so, um, I, you know, I think it's a, a different orientation that a lot of, you know, these, these establishment protectors are taking at this point, uh, which is we refuse to compete with you and we're, and we're, not, and we're not going to. And, and until we can like figure out a theory of, of, of change that, again, still results in, you know, all boats rising where we don't necessarily have a cooperative partner who's willing to like compete in a, in a very traditional type sense. You know, I, I, you know, I think our world is not going to have the bearings that we need to win the advocacy fights of the next, you know, next decade. And this is hard to do, right? So like the tie, the last part of the conversation, this part saying you said, like, it's new entries and so forth. It's hard. We're working, Bellwether's working in Texas. We're creating 25, uh, working with, with existing and new providers. There are 25 uh, uh, new charters that'll be either A, you know, A, A or B charters and their uh, accountability system. And it's just, it's a ton of work. I think there's also like this idea that it's like, even this far in that it's like easy to open schools and all this. And so like getting to competition and building like high quality schools is hard people respond differently to competition. I mean, you, you were saying the literature is complicated and I do, I think it's the idea that schools just immediately respond. Like this is a very political context, which I think points to the third thing and I, that I wanted to ask you about is the politics. So like I looked and not surprisingly, you know, for some schools in Virginia don't fare well on that, right? Cause we don't like, Virginia's not a strong school choice state. There was an article in the times recently that was like, you know, basically saying like if Republicans had done well in the, in the Virginia's midterm election, like there was something going to be a lot of choice, which is just like, it's one of those things people say, but it's actually not true if you understand the political demographics of the state. Texas is the same way. They've had this huge fight over school choice. So like, what are your inferences just in terms of like states you would think would be stronger on choice, but are simply where it's like, it still is like a huge uphill fight. Yeah, well, um, I don't have all the answers. Uh, let me just say that right up, up front. Um, I completely agree in one sense. Like, there's this sort of mystery when you look at the states that have seen a lot of charter growth or a lot of voucher. I mean, it's it's not obviously red states or blue states, right? I mean, the, the last states that don't have uh, charter schools, for example, are places like Nebraska and Montana, right? Um, and so those are not blue states. Um, so what's going on? I, I think, um, I, I'm not sure I want to tackle that so much as, as I want to address your question of like how we should view strategy and the fight moving forward and, and, and where we should really be putting our eggs. I, my personal take, right, is that moving forward, it is largely a defensive effort. And this may not be true in Virginia, sorry, but outside in, in, in other places, you take Texas, right? Texas has a pretty strong charter school law at this point. It has an enormous Latino population, right? And if you look at the numbers, that is the place where the saturation narrative has the least traction, right? I mean, it's just obvious that there is room for growth there. And so what do we need to do in Texas? Well, mostly we need to prevent any legislative rollback, <laughs> right? Um, and we need to keep doing what we're doing. Uh, and it, the charter school movement will continue to grow. Uh, and so that's sort of... Um, it's a boring answer, right, in some sense. But um, one of my pet peeves is the way that the funding community and the reform community and all these people who, frankly, um, make money by talking, right, uh, tend to be attracted to the next shiny thing, right? When in reality, um, the most important thing we can do might be to, you know, just keep doing what we're doing, right, and, and execute. And so I, that's sort of for me, part of the point of the report, part of where I come from to this is like, look, we made a lot of progress between 2010 and 2020. And then all hell break, broke loose, right? And we had this sort of world-changing pandemic and everybody, you know, has a different haircut now, right? 
Uh, and uh, we're all trying to get our bearings again. And it's understandable that we've sort of lost the plot a little bit as a result of that. But guess what? We made a lot of progress between 2010 and 2020. And let's get back to that, right? Let's just keep doing the thing that we were doing because it's not about some you know great innovative new idea. It's just about doing the things that we know work, right? And so that, that's why I personally come from, there are some big states where there's a lot of headroom. And if we can just... Uh, keep things from going off track, I, I think we can keep making progress. Well, that's basically one of Jed, and that's one of our themes. There's uh, always new opportunities waiting around around the corner, waiting to meet you. Um, so, but uh, talk a little bit more, if you would, about like strategy then for advocates. So you're saying execution, the forward of the report talks about, well, okay, like this is probably a roadmap, but like if, if you're thinking in terms of advocacy, which obviously, you know, Jed thinks about all the time, like maybe these states that are in these places that are sort of deserts, they're deserts for a reason. And so you ought to be doubling down on the places with the strong laws and, and, and th that your strategy should be going to places where there's where a more fertile opportunity, or should it be, okay, this is a roadmap to places where there's not a lot of competition, particularly, I don't want to lose. I want to come back to some of the demographic stuff, particularly for kids who often are most underserved by schools today. So that is that is the place to go have that fight. Yeah, I think you can argue it either way. I think the most obvious opportunities are in sort of districts that are sort of school choice deserts within states that have strong, um, mm -hmm. strong laws. So, you know, I mean, personally, I was surprised when I looked at Arizona, for example, I my my sort of in the back of my head, right, I'm always seeing that long list of school choice programs in Arizona, I just right. assume Arizona is super saturated. It's not clear that it is if you look at the number, right? If you actually look at the numbers, it's not clear that it is. Um, and I, I think that's probably also true of places like Florida that are growing so quickly. It's like there's no way that the, the school choice movement could possibly keep up, right? I, I think there are um, a lot of sort of um, hidden, I, I don't know, I don't want to call them hidden gems, but I, I think there are a lot of places that we've overlooked, um, particularly in sort of inner ring suburbs um, that are, uh, you know, it's it just, there's there's plenty of headroom left. And I, I do, I think it's the places where choi uh, school choice is um, happening, but it's not happening everywhere and it's not happening as much as it could. Jed, what about I you? Think, let's, turn, let's turn the tables. Ask the question well, as a question. <laughs> well, I mean, um, look, I think that the story in places like Texas, uh, where people presume that, that everything's rosy for charter schools, um, that has actually not been the case, and they have been, they have struggled to get um, new charters approved at the state board, and they've had cities that have been blocking the, the building of new school buildings, um, and the association tries to run uh, charter-friendly uh, legislation in the state capitol, and who is it that kills it but 25 Republicans? So they had to build the political strength, uh, and they changed, you know, uh, who what those Republicans were in the legislature and now they're able you know to get uh uh bills through the legislature and they're and they've also won elections at the state board race so yes i think texas is perhaps ready to step into that space where we can have the pace of growth that i think uh parents actually demand um but it requires diligence even in the red states and and when we talk about arizona i mean arizona is fascinating right they projected that their voucher program was going to cost 65 million bucks a year and now it's it projected at 900 million 900 million that's how many additional people now some of it is just the people that were already in uh in private school are just getting a subsidy and all that kind of piece but but you know i think we see that you know there are uh, huge, there's huge demand there. The question is, can we get the breakthrough um, uh, policy changes that we want? And then do those policy changes actually increase competition and choice? Because you could argue that, hey, you let universal vouchers happen, but people can top it off with, you know, additional um, tuition payments and they can screen out special ed kids like they can in, 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 in Arizona and they're going to screen out low performing kids. Well, you know, the, the, it may very well be that the kids that we're most focused on getting better opportunities to are actually going to be um, given new choice and new competition, you know, with the new things that we're bringing forward. Let's stay on that, because I thought that was some of those interesting overlays you did, David, like looking at the demographics. And I think one of the things that really 
came through, you know, it, it's another another one of these places, and there are way too many of them where the rhetoric around the sector and all these debates is like equity and equity commitments. And then you look at how these policies play out and you're like, the kids who need this the most, so in particular, you know, low-income kids, black kids, Hispanic kids who are who are most underserved, special ed kids as well as Jed, as Jed mentioned, um, aren't actually seeing the benefits of this. And it seemed like there's a lot of places where there's a lot of competition for upmarket white kids. And so like t talk about that because that just, it, it given like the rhetoric we hear from all the foundations and what everybody cares about and then you see this disconnect it's 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 curious yeah well i think um i i think there is a sense that with the growth of like the the, the charter school movement and, and private school choice that we've equalized the playing field um and we haven't that's the short version mm -hmm. um if you look in the typical big district, uh, you see a very old, <laughs> very familiar story, um, which is that uh, white kids have more access to alternatives um, in large part because they have more access to private schools. One assumes uh, because they have more uh, wealth or, or income, right? Um, and this is where the school choice movement gets a lot of its moral force um, and it's uh, a deep and powerful and important point. Uh, and I don't want to oversell it because we have made progress. And actually, if you look at figure one in the report, uh, you know, you can see that we are close nationally um, to, to actually closing the gap between white kids and black kids. Um, but then when you look in within these big districts, it actually looks different. And I, I'd actually want to dig into that more because um, I, I thought that was sort of intriguing. Um, but when you look in the big districts, often, uh, you see that that it's not, uh, you know, we haven't achieved anything resembling equality, but a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, that's part of why we did the report, honestly, is because you can say this, but people don't really get it unless they see the image. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage people to to go on the report page. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, if I didn't tout the report a little bit. We have these great graphics um, and they allow you to look at every big district in the country um, for every major demographic group. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and you can see how, uh, you know, access to sort of alternative schools either has or hasn't um, been equalized over time. Um, and you can even look within uh, particular groups. Do you have any suggestions, David, on, on how we should be thinking about the design of future choice programs such that, you know, we can actually get more of the low income African American and Latino kids? Uh, I mean, it seems to me as though the way that we design ESAs and, and, and vouchers really matters a lot. And we're at this moment where a lot of new ones are getting approved. I also think there are new things that we can be doing in terms of stimulating the, the creation of charter schools that would actually be attractive to a larger percentage of middle class and, and, and white parents. And it just hasn't historically been a huge focus for us. What are you thinking about, you know, the right things to be focusing on in terms of getting the right mix of choice and competition right now? Yeah, it, there are trade-offs. Uh, I think my, my, my personal view is that um, if, if you funded it only a fraction of what we spend on, on schools, right, uh, then you're inevitably going to get uh, middle-class parents who are sort of just topping off um, their, their private tuition, right? Um, so my, my personal uh, view is that I would rather have a smaller program that's fully funded, right, so that everybody can take advantage of it. In other words, I want you know, the full cost of the private school or the charter or whatever it is um, to be covered so that somebody doesn't have to be sort of glancing at their wallet when they're thinking about school choice. In an ideal world, right, we would have, um, you know, a universal progressively weighted voucher that <laughs> gets taken everywhere. And, and you know, we would have to engage in a thousand and one conversations about regulation and testing and all sorts of things like that. Um, that's probably where we're headed in 2050, right? But there's a lot of uh, ground to cover between between there and and where we are right now. So I, I think that's the most obvious trade off for me. Right, is at a political level, I think there's a lot to be said um, for getting more folks inside the tent. Right, and I think that the school choice movement has paid a price politically um, for the fact that it's often viewed as a way of helping black and brown kids. At the same time, um, I think that the the more thinly we spread whatever dollars we're talking about. 
uh, the less access, real world access, um, traditionally disadvantaged communities are going to have to these alternatives. Um, so there's a real trade off there. Can we pause? So let me put you on the. On that, oh, I'm sorry. What? We just have to pause just for a second. I think I think this is this does not the perverse irony that the movement is seen as disproportionately benefiting black and Hispanic kids by white people who have for the most part been able to find ways around the problems of public schools, either by where they live or sending their kids to private school, hectoring the rest of us about how much they actually care about uh, about black and Hispanic kids um, while the system continues to underserve them. It, it's, 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 it's sort of a really perverse yeah. puzzle that I think we just have to like, and, and some, again, some of it I think shows up in, in this report is politically just pause on. I mean, we could do a whole, we'd be here all afternoon talking about all the sort of perversities in our in our political discourse right now. Um, but that is one that's like hard. It, it, is, it is hard to miss. And I think we we almost say it like it's unremarkable, but it's like, it's, yeah. if you stop and think about it, it's very unusual. Well, Andy, let me ask you, you asked me a question, I'll put one back to you. So, I mean, what do you think? So the, the mode of all charter folk is keep our heads low as you know, Republicans are doing their universal voucher stuff right now. Uh, and and that's what we did in Arizona. And now we're on the other side and the charter people are coming back to the association and saying, wait a second, uh, this voucher design program, it's it's simply not fair, right? And it's not, it's not, it, it's skewed toward advantage, advantaging the advantaged. Um, so what is your thought here? Should we be like charging into buzzsaws and, and asserting our concerns as these things are being considered, or do we keep our heads low? Get you know, say that there's actually some progress if there is more choice that's created, and then after the fact, go in and try and it, refine the programs. You know, once they're up and going. Do you have any? I mean, do you have any thoughts on? I think what's I don't the right thing to be doing here. Yeah, the, the answer is I don't know because it is situational. I think it's place by place, and we should acknowledge we're in a very sort of transitory time in terms of how we deliver education. So like the charter schools had a huge adverse impact on the Catholic schools. Some people were very concerned about that. Some people were indifferent to it. Some people thought that was good. Um, uh, but like it was clear it was an impact. And if you think the Catholic schools were sort of an important part of the community, provided a good option, did a good job on character education or whatever, that, that was a concern, but it didn't stop us from having charter schools. And I feel like it's these programs it's 101. I think it's going to like in different places, it's going to, okay, we're going to have a chance to come in and refine where there's problems and others we may not. And so when that negotiation is actually happening, you need to be at the table. I just think it's, I'd be very leery to have some unified field theory. Maybe David does, but it just seems very yeah. situational. It just seems very situational uh, to me in different places and different contexts. And we just have to acknowledge there will be trade-offs. Part of the problem with the whole dialogue is every trade-off just gets weaponized. But there, that this is that's just policy one on one. There's going to be trade offs to these different uh, to these different approaches. David, do you want to? Do you have a I, unified field theory on how we should handle this? I I don't have a unified field theory. Um, yeah, I think uh, in my experience, right, the average traditional public school teacher cares authentically about just you know traditionally disadvantaged kids, right? And I think that's why we have a hard time getting through to people is because that's so manifestly the case if you talk to real world teachers as actual parents do the institutional incentives are hugely problematic right so you think about the fight for for example um you know funding equity within districts right i mean arguably if that it's a, it's a totally rational thing to do if you're most worried about losing kids at the high end right um, the kids who might go to private schools, well, of course, you're going to put more money towards um, the schools that are, are, are trying to keep those kids, right? So, I, you know, I think part of the challenge is that um, so much of this operates in the realm of market theory and economics. And um, it, it, the average person's experience of school um, and the average person's experience of teachers is, is very different. So, um, I don't know. I'm going to leave the politics to you guys, in all honesty. So <laughs> I'm a researcher. I appreciate your bringing me into this wonderful uh, political dialogue, but I am not the expert. Yeah, no, I think, well, I think it's hard. I don't think there's a clear answer. I think we, so it's, it's, it's more just how do you, uh, I do think people care a great deal 
uh, in the abstract and they care a great deal with the kids right in front of them, there's a gap. And you look at the system again and again, you see that gap sort of, how do we translate this at any scale? So like, I mean, some of the divisions in your report I'm familiar with, and, and like, I don't think it's a lack of caring in the central office. They just have different priorities. They care about public relations. They care about the story that they're going to tell. They don't want competition. Um, you know, and, and so I don't know that caring is the right, as a political matter, we need to have the debate on those other, on those other terms. Yeah. When I talk to the average um, DC Democrat, right. Uh, it's, they're remarkably convincible, but I think a lot of the way motiva motiva motivated reasoning works that people don't realize is it's about attention bias, right? People just don't, simp they don't think about this, right? Um, they care about climate change. They care about whatever, right? They, they, they don't realize that the fact that education isn't at, you know, for poor kids isn't at the top of their agenda um, is itself a manifestation of um, sort of the conversation that they've been a part of, what they're swimming in. And so the first thing you have to do is assert like, look, no, this matters a lot, right? You care about this. Um, you say you care about this, right? Now think about it for a second. Um, and so, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. have any big answer except you take them one at a time and you try and change their minds. And I think also well, this idea, and Jed knows this, like how do we get people to realize, and Jed, I know you want to talk about this, that this lifts all boats because... If it's if it's either portrayed as a zero sum or people think it's any kind of a zero sum, I mean that was one of the lessons out of Massachusetts. They're not going to be with you, and so it has to it has to be part of like a broad opportunity oriented agenda that people see. Like this, this isn't going to this doesn't carry like a huge cost for me, even if it carries great benefits for others. Yeah, it depends on what sea you know we we think uh, boats are rising on, and one of them could be on academic performance. And you you named David some of the other ones we could be thinking about. But I also think there's just a, a, a fairness and, and allocation of educational opportunity in, in more equitable ways and, and allocation of, of resources in more fair ways, too. And, you know, I think the way that we keep people's attention on things is by focusing on ourselves and having policy agendas that reflect it. You know, it, it just drives me crazy that a place like Newark, we know what Newark is doing. The charter schools are growing and, and the charter schools of Newark are doing a phenomenal job, right? The district feels the competitive pressure. What does it do? It makes a bunch of new selective admissions magnets. You know, and and then it sucked and puts a ton of money into those selective admissions magnets. And then we've got, you know, a lot of schools where a large number of kids are are in, in schools that are abjectly worse than as bad as any we've ever had. And we we stand here and and don't articulate that 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 this is in fact happening. And so yet again, another generation has found a new way to screw over the kids that need better education more. And I think, you know, it's a moment where all advocates, and yes, I think the charter school world, we need to take our share of, of, of naming that these things are happening and naming policy proposals that we think would uh, make uh, the situation better than it is. So David, question for you. I mean, you can listen to us, uh, Jed and I, get me frustrated at the unfairness of it all, all day. Like question for you, what surprised you with this? I mean, part of the fun of doing this work is like often you're rolling up things empirically that you kind of either knew already empirically or intuitively, but then you come across something that sort of totally surprises whatever your, you know, ingoing hypothesis was. So for you, as, as you did this work, what are some things that, that, that surprised you that you found out? I was surprised by just how little private school choice had changed. Um, I expected uh charter schools to be the dominant story in many of these places and it was basically the only story um I, you know I, I should caveat that by saying that the data we have for for homeschooling and for private schooling is is not quite as solid as the data for charter schools nevertheless i really thought there would be some districts where uh you know you were seeing like some of the growth was driven by by you know vouchers or private schools or whatever for the decade we looked at, that really wasn't the case. Um, I'm, I'm sure that if we looked at, say, Milwaukee, you know, a couple decades back, we would see that. But this decade was almost exclusively a story of charter school growth. And that that surprised me. It may not be true for the coming decade, um, but it was true mm -hmm. for the one that, that just happened. Well, David, this is great research in general. And, you know, I... Um... 
you know, am eager to see what you're going to do next. And, um, and what are you going to do I, next? I think, Can we pause on that for a second. You said yeah. something earlier we were talking about something you said I want to dig into. Is this, is there more to come? Give us a, a preview. Well, there's, there's always more to come. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, you know, we, we've got some great reports coming out uh, in the next few months. Um, I'll, I'll just say um, that, you know, I, I always think about school choice. And um, we're also thinking about accountability these days because we feel like um, we've been on vacation for too long. So um, Fordham is looking um, for a way to restart the conversation around accountability, um, not necessarily meaning go back to no, no child left behind. I don't think anybody wants to do that. Right. But trying to get our hands around, uh, you know, the issue with attendance, um, the issues with uh, just grade inflation, the issues with all, all these cultural shocks that happened as a result of um, the pandemic that we're now trying to unwind and get back to, you know, like holding kids and ourselves to high standards um, and sort of insisting on excellence. So um, those are the big themes of the things that we're going to be coming out with in the next couple of years, I think. Um, and we're just going to keep beating those drums. Excellent. Hey, you're going to see it. Share it with us when we got it. We'll have you back for another conversation. This has been really I, great, David. I would love to come back. Uh, it's so nice to show you my baby grand back there. Um, <laughs> and uh, you guys are a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Great. Well, um, Andy, we'll uh, we'll wrap up for now, and um, you know we'll hopefully get one more recording in before the end of the end of the year. But um, uh, we'll we'll wrap up from here, I think. Thanks, Chad. I'll see you soon. Okay. See you guys. Thanks so much.